I was born in 1950 in Melbourne and we uh, lived close by to my mother's parents uh, at the time in Reservoir uh, where I first grew up and we often saw and were very close to my father's parents as well so in uh, the first few years of my life we had a lot to do with my grandparents and uh, you know saw them regularly. What were their names? Ah, now you test me. Well, I was named after my two grandfathers, so I'm James for James Stanley, who was my father's father, and Alexander for Alexander Sladden, who was my uh, mother's father. And uh, my grandmother, Sladden, was Alice, but she was always called Dobby for Dobson. She was Alice Dobson Sladden. My uh, father's mother was Jessie, uh, or Janet, Jessie uh, Bacon. She'd uh, been a McKellar and uh, was a very strong figure in my family, uh, although she died just after my father when I was 12. She, uh, she was a very strong personality and was very active within the Presbyterian Church and uh, in you know, organisations. And she, uh, she was certainly the first person I came across who was involved in public speaking and she used to travel around a lot and we'd go and stay on holidays with, uh, with her and uh, my grandfather and uh, you know, often went to, and I had to sit in the car with my grandfather outside while she went inside and made speeches. I never did know what the speeches were about but she, she did it very often so I think she must have been an effective public speaker. The only speech of hers that I've ever... was actually an article that I've ever read was... Uh, one that she wrote in 1924. She'd uh, lost three of her brothers during the First World War and uh, wrote an article about the dedication of a war memorial near uh, Hamilton in Victoria in 1924. And I actually used a quote from it in a speech I made at an unveiling of a plaque for a VC winner in Tasmania last Anzac Day. Do what you, else do you want? <laughs> what, what about uh, occupations? What did they oh, well, for both my father's parents were lifelong teachers and uh, were school superintendents, so they moved around Victoria a lot, uh, certainly in the years when my father was a child and uh, you know, growing up, when he was growing up. So they lived in many of the country towns around uh, Victoria. In, uh, I think they started off, my father was born in Warrigal, but they lived also in Horsham and... Uh, throughout the Wimmera, the southwest, and uh, they were teachers. Uh, my mother's parents, uh, her mother, as far as I know, never worked, but uh, her, her father uh, was uh, a highly decorated uh, soldier from the First World War who went away from Victor Harbour in South Australia as a uh, 18, 19-year-old, and... Uh, had saw a lot of action at uh, Gallipoli and in France and won the military cross twice, was promoted in the field from an ordinary signalman. It's a, and he just last year got uh, his war record from the War Memorial in Canberra and uh, it's uh, quite stunning to read of someone who was so young, had been a telegraph boy in Victor Harbour, went away at 18, 19 by the time he was 23 and came back, he had uh, must have been promoted to an officer and uh, had advanced through the ranks, been highly decorated. But his life was affected uh, ever after from his experience, and uh, he suffered from I think what now would be commonly thought to either be manic depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And even though he worked for the PMG between the wars and then was in the army again, uh, working in Melbourne during the Second World War, his health was severely affected. And I have very vague memories of him only. A couple of things I remember about him was uh, going to their house in Cheddar Road in Reservoir, which was just across the railway line from where we lived in Edward Street, and uh, 
he used to be an expert at cutting bread very thin, <laughs> which, which meant we could have very thin toast. <laughs> but the, the milkman used to come along with his horse-drawn cart along Cheddar Road with the cream and uh, having very thin bread in cream was... <laughs> It was one memory I've got of him and the only other memory I really have was when we moved in 1957 to Camberwell and uh, my parents bought a house which had a flat off the side of it and uh, my mother's parents lived there. Uh, my grandfather died I think in 1957 or 1958 so just after we moved to the house, probably 1958 maybe even 59 but all the time, my only memories of him in that house were when he was sick and uh, in bed and uh, he, uh, I couldn't say that I have very clear memories of him or uh, much contact with him, really. My mother's mother I had a lot of contact with because she lived with us uh, there until we left that house in 64 and then she lived close by for the rest of her life. Uh, my father's parents as I said have been teachers got very early memories of my paternal grandfather in particular she uh, she took well I think she and she certainly claimed she taught me to read before I went to school my mother now disputes that and says that I refused to learn but the first day at school all of a sudden I could read and mum says that that grand my father's mother taught my sisters to read uh, before they went to school but not me but whether she did or she didn't she certainly inculcated in us all how important uh, education was and reading and uh, writing and uh, arguing a point of view which she was uh, pretty good at Did, they, did you, any of your grandparents have uh, overt political interests and views? Well, certainly not that I was aware of. If, uh, I mean, my mother's mother died uh, when I was in my 20s, but in fact not long after my first son was born, but she, uh, she certainly had no political beliefs that uh, I was aware of or she ever uh, put forward. She was uh, more interested in a gin and tonic and a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> and she, and I mean she was an interesting woman too. She, when I got my grandfather's war record, I discovered that uh, my grandmother, my grandmother's address in England when she married my grandfather was Her Majesty's Prison at Bedford. <laughs> now I was a little bit shocked to read this, uh, but then it quickly explained in the next line where her father was the governor of uh, Her Majesty's Prison at Bedford, which. <laughs> did produce a bit of a wry smile from me because my grandmother always implied that she was, uh, if not from the aristocracy, not far off it. So I don't know whether the governor of a prison qualifies as lower aristocracy or not, but uh, she was always very kind to me. I mean, one of the, uh, her weaknesses, if uh, certainly is a weakness, was that she had a completely one-eyed view about the men in the family compared with the women and she did uh, over the years have a fairly difficult relationship I think with my mother and with at least some of my sisters uh, but her son, my uncle, uh, his two sons, myself, my father could never do any wrong in her eyes and, <laughs> and so I think she was always very kind and good to me. I think uh, in terms of political views, certainly my father's father never expressed any. He was a very conservative, social, socially conservative person who uh, was very correct in everything he did, very courteous and polite to everybody, uh, and if anything took a back seat to my grandmother who was uh, far more dynamic personality, far more outgoing and uh, my grandfather, my father's father always seemed far more at ease with us when we were children and as we got older he found it more and more difficult to uh, relate to us and uh, you know, he died uh, 
and I was uh, perhaps 20 around then and uh, he lived a very sad and lonely life after my grandmother died. She died three months after my father in 1962 and the family wisdom of had it's always been that she died of a broken heart having lost a son but whether that's so or not uh, she really did have a big influence in our family and uh, the only political interest that she had. My mother tells me that uh, she was involved or a supporter of the country party when it was first formed in Victoria uh, in the 1920s I think when it was very much an agrarian socialist party rather than the uh, rather sad what passes for the country party today but whether or not I, I certainly never spoke to her about it she never spoke about it and uh, no, she was very passionate uh, about the futility of war. Uh, whether she was a pacifist or not, I wouldn't, couldn't really say, but certainly uh, you know, she had a, a good understanding of people's lives and I think she always felt that one was on earth to try and make life better for other people. And uh, as far as politics go, I think that's as far as I could really say about my grandparent. The other aspect of my father's mother was that she always encouraged open discussion, debate, and was a very willing participant in any debates or arguments, discussions that were going on. And that's something that my father and mother certainly encouraged too. So from a very early age, I certainly heard plenty of arguments about politics, life, why we're here everything else. It was a regular part of life around the dinner table and uh, I think that's uh, probably the first sort of political discussions that I ever heard. Can we speak about your parents now, Jim? Do you know what were their names? Uh, where were they born? What did they do for a living? Well, my father was, was Frank, Francis Alfred Leonard, who was born in 1920 uh, and I said earlier, travelled around or lived in many different parts of Victoria during his youth. Uh, they eventually settled in Melbourne and Murrumbina and he did an accelerated medical course at the University of Melbourne just before or just at the commencement of war, I think, of the Second World War and very shortly after graduation was away in New Guinea as a quite young doctor. He came back from the wars very ill, had malaria and lost uh, a great deal of weight and suffered from recurrences of the malaria for the rest of his life uh, on a, well, from my memory, maybe an annual basis. But my mother would obviously know a lot more about that than my older sisters. And he established a general practice in Reservoir just after the war, which was then growing very rapidly with post-war migration and the outer suburbs of Melbourne, or what was then the outer suburbs, developed very quickly a very, very busy practice. So my early memories of my father was always of him being at work or coming home very late at night or very early in the morning or going back out again. He was uh, one of the generation of general practitioners sadly long gone that actually cared about every one of his patients and thought nothing about getting up in the middle of the night to go and see you know, a child if they were sick or something like this and I've had that uh, come back to me and I've met people over the years who knew my father quite extraordinary that when I became Premier of Tasmania some of the messages I got were from people who had been my father's patients and they all spoke in the most glowing terms of him the chap who's the president of the Hotels Association in Tasmania's brother was delivered by my father. <laughs> and, uh, and he always says his mother swore, swore by my father as being the best doctor she'd ever come across. But unfortunately, he, he uh, worked himself into an early grave and died of heart disease at 42. Uh, there was some political involvement. My mother tells me that he was approached by Labor Party people to stand 
in, I'm pretty sure it would have been Lawler, the electorate uh, that Harry Jenkins ended up holding for a very long period, and then Barry Jones. But I don't, I've certainly only ever heard that from my mother, so, and, and in any event, he, his commitment was to medicine and to working as a GP, so he didn't take it up. But uh, my mother, was born in 1920 as well. She was a nurse who met my father while she was nursing. He was a uh, young doctor, try, still training, I think. And she continued nursing uh, up until my eldest sister, Jenny, was born in 1942. And then only returned to work after my father died, and then only uh, uh, intermittently. But. No, both my mother and father, you know, very, I was very fortunate, so were my sisters, that they really denied us nothing. <laughs> we're very fortunate. We had a very, very fortunate childhood. Uh, obviously, my father had a reasonable income, and, and so we really were very well provided for. And in addition, uh, they set very good examples to us in terms of, particularly I think, in terms of uh, serving other people and being dedicated to the interests of other people rather than themselves. My father was uh, like his mother, and at least like uh, some of my sisters, perhaps myself, very outgoing, gregarious sort of people, and we all really enjoy the company of all different sorts of people and uh, have always enjoyed mixing with all sorts. I remember often my father would you know, he'd have uh, some of his Italian patients that be at home doing jobs with him, you know, in the house or in the garden and having a bottle of vino and all this stuff. And it, he really, you know, he did mix with all sorts uh, of people and he's a wonderful fellow. but. He died when I was 12, so my memories of him are fairly limited too. Unfortunately, as time goes by, you really remember less and less. Did, do you, did he ever mention how he ended up to be in Reservoir? No, not, not as far as I'm aware. I'm sure my mother and maybe uh, my older sisters might, uh, might know why, but in terms of... <laughs> it being a successful general practice because of the growing population and uh, the fact that they did, he and the partners who joined him uh, were prepared to work so hard and I think it, it was a uh, good business decision I guess but it was certainly, uh, no and the practice grew very rapidly by the time he died I think there were half a dozen partners in the practice which he'd started on his own in the late 40s so it grew very rapidly, but I don't know why. Did either of your parents have uh, religious beliefs? Well, my father's mother, as I, I think I said before, was, was active in the Presbyterian Church, but neither of my parents have ever shown anything to me personally that I would think was religious conviction. I think my father certainly went to church on the odd occasions when he did like Easter and Christmas, uh, because his mother expected him to rather than anything else. And my mother, I think very similarly, and certainly now she has no religious beliefs and I, I'm not aware of them ever having, having any. Uh, I wasn't baptised when I was born. I ended up being baptised when I was 15 or something and uh, for some now unknown reason decided I wanted to be confirmed in the Presbyterian Church. But it was a very short-lived <laughs> connection. Can I ask, Jim, uh, uh, how the death of your father affected you at the time? Well, it was devastating. Devastating. And I don't think... Now I'm 50, so we're talking about 38 years ago. I don't think I've had a single day of my life since when I haven't thought about him. And it, I don't know that I was so aware of it at the time, but certainly others in the family have said that because I was the only boy uh, and 
I'd say I, I didn't feel this at the time, but many people said I, it was worse for me. I don't believe that that's so at all. Uh, certainly, my mother suffered very deeply. I was really uh, deeply grief-stricken for a number of years after. And perhaps now, you know, I'm older than they were at the time. I can really understand that because they had a very, very close, loving relationship. And Mum left with five children at 42. The youngest, my sister Mary, was eight then, and I was 12, three older sisters. But I was fortunate too that, you know, the school I was at Scotch College and, and I have to say I was very fortunate in that all the teachers, the male teachers, who uh, they tried to help me through all that period were very good role models, if you like, and they certainly uh, showed a lot of concern for me and and help, but, you know, emotionally, I think for any child, but possibly 12 is a little bit worse than if you were younger, because you do understand that it's final, that you're not going to see them again, that everything about your life before is going to be different in the future, and I really do so see my childhood as being pre- a father's death being like just an idyllic life and perfect happiness. <laughs> School at home <laughs> with my family, friends, everything. And then you know, whether it was I was 12 and so you know, going into teenage years or not, or whether that's part of it or it was simply that my father died, certainly things became very much more difficult afterwards. It was very difficult for my mother. You know, she uh, obviously no one can be prepared for something like that happening but I think because they were so devoted to each other and to us that it really did hit mum very very hard and she was wonderful to uh, particularly to me and Mary in the years in the next few years after that when she was suffering worse but no, it's a lesson, I suppose, you've got to learn sometime in your life that death does come and go, but you've just got to keep going. Life does just continue. And whether you like it or not, you wake up the next morning and off you go again. Now, I, I, as I say, I think I was very fortunate that I had a lot of support and certainly very good friends who were very good to me and their parents were good to me and the school looked after me. So... Uh, I think emotionally it was very, very difficult and I've got no doubt that it has sort of shaped part of the person I am or have been for the rest of my life. But you know, I, I certainly uh, don't think I had it any worse. My mother certainly suffered worse out of it all and uh, my younger sister Mary. I think it was very difficult for her as it was for Janet, my next eldest sister who had been, all of us were close to my father, but Janet was particularly close and ended up being a doctor as he was. And she, I think, uh, was probably, of all of us, other than mum, was the most deeply affected by. Uh, did, did they ever tell you uh, how they met? Well, on, only uh, that they'd, mum, I think was doing nursing training at the same time Dad was, but they met through work at a hospital. Nearly every doctor, I don't know, in those days it seemed that all the doctors we knew, and we knew a lot, all of their wives had been nurses. <laughs> so a lot of our family friends were nurses or doctors, and uh, particularly after Mum died, the nurses had worked with Dad or done their training with Mum. Uh, they were the most regular visitors and friends of the family, and a group of three women in particular who'd done nursing training with mum uh, looked after us uh, and were very very kind to us for well for the rest of our lives but particularly in the years uh, immediately after my father's death because you wouldn't have been in Camberwell for very long at that stage would well, we moved there in 1957 and he died in 62 so oh, well. I can't remember what time of year we moved but about five years but of course I mean, the other effect on my life, and again, more on my mother's and mine, was uh, that the family income <laughs> was very, very sharply reduced overnight. And uh, you know, Dad 
live life to the full and, and had the mortgage and everything else to go with it. And mum's income dropped from you know, being the wife of a successful general practitioner to being on a war widow's pension. So I, uh, there's a school awarded me a scholarship uh, the same year my father died. And then later on, I won Commonwealth scholarships and so on, and so did my sisters. And uh, that was really the way we stayed at the schools we were at, and uh, with assistance, uh, scholarship assistance. So, in terms of our lifestyle and being at a private school, I guess uh, you know I couldn't do everything that all the other uh, boys did. Obviously, a lot from very wealthy families, but I never went without or anything like that and uh, I really had uh, a very privileged upbringing. Jim, I wanted to ask now a bit more about your own uh, birth and infancy. Now, w when exactly were you born? What's your birth date? <laughs> I was born on the 15th of May 1950 at the Mercy Hospital in East Melbourne. I don't know what time it is and I, I know very definitely I don't know because just after I became Premier, an astrologer wrote to me and said she'd be delighted to do my horoscope <laughs> if I could just provide her with the time of my birth <laughs> she could do it for me and being a sceptic in virtually all things I decided to make up a time of birth <laughs> the horoscope that came back <laughs> wasn't one I'd own up to <laughs> but, <maybe. laughs> but uh, no so mum doesn't remember the time but she had a very difficult pregnancy and She'd been in bed for the best part of uh, uh, five or six months before I was born. And as the only boy, and there's four sisters, three elder, I guess I was uh, sport rotten. I <laughs> said, <laughs> yeah, baby boy, as I said before, the nurses, mum's friends who were around and dad's friends who were around and everybody else. Uh, and what are you, what's your full name? Uh, James Alexander. You, you told me earlier about the origin of James. Yeah. I'm, uh, well, I'm named after both my grandfathers, James for my father's father and Alexander okay. for my mother's father. But the, I suppose, next event in my life was when I was nine months old, I had what was called an intersusception, which is the bowel telescoping inside the body and had to be rushed to the children's hospital for an operation, uh, which sorted it out. But my mother and father were certainly very, very worried about me at the time and my mother uh, has often told me about them sitting outside the hospital while I was, uh, whilst I was being operated on. I was nine months old, obviously I have no memory of this, all I have is a scar to show for it. So. Did it have any lasting effect on your health? No, no. no. Were you healthy? Yeah, absolutely, I was extremely healthy apart from having my tonsils out. I think on my eighth or ninth birthday, something like that, because I can remember getting a birthday card as I woke up and was spewing everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> spewing blood. <laughs> but uh, no, I had excellent health. And what excellent. about your mother's health after the birth? Did you well, she she uh, then had Mary in uh, a few, uh, Mary a few years later, uh, but. I mean, I think she, she certainly recovered uh, eventually. I have no knowledge of how long it took her, but it was a very difficult pregnancy and uh, she had been quite ill during it and with very high blood pressure. Uh, so, you know, I think she was no doubt relieved <laughs> that uh, in the end everything sorted out. Was it your mother who was your main carer when you were growing up? Oh, well, very definitely in the early years because my father was so busy working and we actually lived, uh, our house was attached to the surgery where Dad saw patients. So Mum worked extremely hard with uh, you know, five youngish children next door to a practice. She'd have to help out sometimes as well as look after the house and look after us. So she was very definitely my, uh, my primary carer. This was in Reservoir. In Reservoir, yeah. Do you remember the address there at all? I think it was 41 or 42 Edward Street, Reservoir. Oh, yeah. It's on the corner, which, and it's now a uh, childcare centre. <laughs> so I did go on a, 
nostalgic drive through reservoir again many years later and I couldn't I couldn't recognise anything just about except the railway crossing and uh, the corner on which we lived. So. <laughs> do, you, do you have any memories of uh, learning to speak and learning to read? Well, I certainly don't about learning to speak. The only uh, memories I have, but which my mother contradicts, is that I remember learning to read with my grandmother before I went to school and Mum says I didn't. But whatever, I, I must have learnt to read very quickly because uh, when I started at school, I was very quickly put in a group who had to go and read with the headmaster every, you know, whether it was every day or once a week or something, I don't know. This was at Reservoir State School. Shall we continue again? I think we better do it another Next time. Week, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that.